guys. We're doing uh, another another set of six free responses, starting with number one and number two. Welcome back if you're just joining us. If not, um, and you're starting to get the hang of this, I hope you're starting to see some um, some of the same kind of mentality over and over again. Also, this number one and number two, uh, we're going to hope this works out, but I have had to modify the heck out of these. These were calculator problems, which are asking good questions, um, but just not uh, not great without a calculator. Uh, so I've had to change them up. Hopefully they'll be great for you. Uh, we will certainly know by the time I get done with this video. So anyway, without further ado, here we go. All right, guys. So first thing we're doing is we are um, we're looking at number one. Remember, this was a calculator question. Um, now it's not. So I've had to change the a lot of the equations to make them doable um, in the in the whole context of this problem. I actually added a part B. Well, I added another kind of part in here, which gave it uh five parts all the way through E. I don't know that I've ever seen that on an AP test, but whatever. Just trying to get this to work out to be um, to be something that you might see on your AP test. So as far as points go, we'll kind of figure that out, but uh, here we go. So first thing is how many people enter the line? Uh, if I'm reading the question, it says the rate at which people enter the line is given by this piecewise function, all right? R is measured in people per minute. T is measured in minutes. As people get on the escalator, they exit the line at a constant rate of five. So this is the rate of entering the line. It's a function. And there, here is the rate of exiting the line. It is just a constant value of five. Okay? And it also says there are 20 people at time zero. All right. So uh, first thing is how many people are going to enter the line on that interval right there. So if this is a rate, what do you do, do to get an amount? Now remember, you're going to integrate a rate to get an amount, and if I wanna know, or the change in the amount, and if I wanna know how many people enter, that is a change in the amount of what entered the line. So I am going to integrate this thing. All right, let me get that right. I'm going to integrate this rate, but since I'm only going from zero to six, I don't have to integrate each part, right? I don't have to find the change there and then the change there, only the change from zero to six. So I'm just integrating uh, the negative t squared plus six t function dt from zero to six, okay? And that shouldn't be a big deal to integrate that. I get, I get a negative t cubed over three to integrate that. I get a positive 6t squared over 2, and the 6 over 2 gives me a 3. And I'm integrating from 0 to 6, so I'm going to include all of that in parentheses. And then I'm just going to plug the 6 in. Now, I know that, uh, honestly, in real life, when you plug that 6 and that 0 and subtract, and I say real life, I mean when you do that, more than likely you are going to get a... Um, and I really hope this is a positive value. If it's not, we're just gonna go with it. Um, because again, I made all this junk up. If I, uh, more than likely, they say you don't need a calculator, but on this particular one, when I plug a six in there, some of you know that that's 216 when I cube it, but I'm guessing most of you do not. Okay, and then I'm gonna add that to three times a 36, and then I'm gonna subtract what I get when I have a zero in here. Okay, so we're gonna, if we get a negative here, again, I'm just make, I'm trying to make this problem work, but look at this. If I divide that into that, it actually goes 72. So I end up with a negative 72. Oh no, it works out great, okay. And then three times that gives me a, um, what, a 108, All right? And then minus zero. So I end up with 108 minus 72, which is, what, 36 people? Okay, so hopefully that is correct. I'm sure that you will tell me if it's not. All right, so 36 people entered the line to get on the escalator, all right? Now, the second thing says write the calculus expression used to determine how many people exit the escalator. Because a lot of people don't think about calculus. They just go, wait, five people per minute for six minutes, and they multiply and they get 30. But really, what is the calculus expression that you did? Again, it's a rate. If I integrate the rate... I get the change in the amount. So when I integrate that, I get 5t from zero to six, which is 30 minus zero or 30 people. All right, 
So that's the part that I added in there just to make sure you understood that, that for those of you that are thinking, well, I would just go five times 30. That's probably fine on the AP test, but I wanted to point out that it is calculus that backs that up. Okay, so um, on, by the way, how would we have scored points here? Um, I'm believing that I would give you um, one point for the actual integral right there, and then you'd get one point for your answer. And then right here, you just got one point for, I'm sorry, said write the calculus expression. Um, we're gonna say uh, plus a half, plus a half for a total of uh, one point right there. All right, now looking at part C, it says during that interval from zero to six, there are always people in line for the escalator, right? It says how many people are in line at time six? Well, if you think about it, the number of people, that would be a function of one, how many people um, were there when we began, and then how many people entered during those six minutes, and how many people uh, exited during those six minutes. So at time six, I'm gonna say, well, at time zero, um, I ended up, I mean, I had 20, because that's what it told me in the original problem, and then uh, the number of people that are entering from zero to six would be this, and by the way, we've already calculated that. So if you wanted just to put RT, R of T right there, and then you could just come down and say, hey, 36 people entered. And then right here, how many people uh, are in line? I'm sorry, and then you have, that's the entering, right? And then you had exiting. So you subtract the integral from zero to six of five DT, but you've already calculated that. So you're subtracting 30. So at this point, we do the math and we end up with 26 people that happened to be in line during this time period. And the way you would have gotten credit for that um, on part C is, da, 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 what would they have done right there? Oh yeah, uh, you had to consider uh, this right here and you had to consider that initial value. So the initial value was worth a plus one and then your answer was worth a plus one. So, so far we're at five points, okay? And the last part, I got two more parts, um, part D, so for part D, um, I've already gotten started here. It says, what's the first time T that there are no people in line for the escalator? All right, so basically, if you think about this and you go back to the original question, the original question said for the first six minutes, people were entering the line, but after six minutes, they were not entering the line. There was nobody entering, but it said that people continue to, uh, people get on the escalator, they exit the line at a constant rate. So they're still, exiting at five people per minute. So the question is right here, uh, what's the first time that there's no people? So I've got it. So basically nobody else is entering the line, but you still have people exiting the line. Well, how many people were in line at the end of those six minutes that still have to exit? Well, I've already done that in part C. So the 26 comes from the part C. Okay. So since there's 26 people there, I have to say, well, how long will it take me to get rid of those 26 people. Now, a lot of you can do the algebra and you can go, oh, well, if I'm exiting at five persons a minute, it's gonna take me five and one, what, one fifths minute? So five and one fifth, uh, but they wanna see the calculus. Now, by the way, you in the real problem, you wouldn't have been able to do it that simply, okay? So you'd actually have to do a little bit better in that regard to actually show what you're doing, okay? So what I wanna do is actually show that and say, um, and actually it says, when is, what is the first time? Okay, so we're gonna look at that in a second, but I wanna figure out how much additional time uh, has actually transpired from, um, from the point I am now to the end. Now there's two ways you can go about this. If I kind of re restart it and say, okay, now there's 26 people, how long do I take to get rid of them? So because my rate is five, I can integrate the rate all right, uh, D whatever, DX, DT, uh, I'm probably gonna use DX because I'm gonna have a variable here. And I'm gonna say, starting at my new now, at the end of six minutes, one way to do it is to say how long, how much time would have to occur after six minutes, how much time would have to occur to be able to empty that 26 and make it hit zero. Now that's one way of thinking. Now another way of thinking is to say, forget that. I'm now saying at five people per hour or minute or whatever, 
now that I'm already at six, from six to what time, right there, would I finally hit zero? And what this is gonna do is recognize what is the actual time. This is saying how much additional time occurred from six minutes beyond. So in this case, I'm gonna have to take that T and add it back to the original six minutes because I started a new time at time, I let my time zero be six here. Here, by saying, wait a minute, no, at time six, how many, when will be my actual new time, not how many more minutes it's gonna take. So watch the math on this. 26 minus, to integrate five, I get five X, and I wanna integrate that from zero to T. If I'm doing it this way, I'm gonna say, all right, I get five X, I'm gonna integrate that from six to T. And I'm gonna find out when I end up with no people left. So doing the math here, 26 minus, so I'm gonna plug a T in and get five T. I'm gonna plug a zero in and get zero. I'm gonna subtract those. And I end up with 26 minus five T, right? And when I set that equal to zero and solve, I get T equals five and one fifth minutes, okay? Now it said at, what is the first time? Okay, well this is five and one fifth minutes after I got to the end of six minutes. So the total, would be six plus five and one fifth or 11 and one fifth minutes later. Okay, now I liked this. This said, wait, I wanna find from time six to time T, how many, how long, what would that new time be? So it's not saying, hey, I'm rebooting it at six and calling it zero. It's just saying, I'm picking up right where I left off. Now watch the math on this. In the end, you'll still get the same value. So plug a T in plug a six in, subtract those, and I get 26 minus five T plus 30 when I distribute the negative. I add the five T, I add that together and get 56, and I get T, five goes into that, 11 and one fifth times. So this took 11 and one fifth minutes to empty that because it didn't restart and find a new calculation based on six minutes out. So I kind of like this. Most people actually do this. In fact, even AP kind of did this, but I'm, I'm a bigger fan of D, but it's up to you. All right, and then in part E, it says, all right, from zero to six minutes, there's a certain time where the number of the people in the line is maximized. Huh, now it didn't say relative max, it said maximized. So write, but do not, eva but do not evaluate the equation you would use to determine some of these possible times. Okay, so what I do to find maximization is I need to know, if I'm talking about the number of people, uh, where is it maximized, I need to take the number of people equation, which if you know, if you're careful, you've already done this, right? In part C, you said the number of people from zero to six was 20 plus the integral from zero to six of negative T squared plus six T and then you said minus the integral from zero to six of five dt. And you said that was the number of people from zero to six. Well, if I wanna know where it's maximized, I wanna know at what time, at what time is this people function maximized? Well, I wanna take the derivative of this, okay? And if I take the derivative of it and set it equal to zero or d and e, that tells me where this people function, which I used in C, would be maximized. Now that's just gonna give me some of those times. Other than these, are there any other times? Well, yeah, because you look at endpoints for maxes. So also, and by the way, I'm gonna clean that up, but also at t equals zero and t equals six, because these are endpoints, okay? So I would need to calculate this, and let's see if I can do that. So the derivative of 20 is zero. Now what's the derivative of the integral of this? Well guys, I'm just gonna DDX everything. I'm gonna go all the way through there and DDX stuff. Now let's do the math on this. The derivative of that, the integral gets canceled, okay? And, um, oh actually it says write but don't evaluate it. So I'm actually done. You could either have written what I had here or when you take the derivative of 20, you get zero. The derivative of this, you just plug the T in, 
And by the way, I should have written this with X's uh, right there, X's right here, so that when I plug the T in for X, I now get this. So that's probably, they probably would have given you credit for that, but you're not supposed to have the same variable here and here. So if you want it to end up being time, which I do, you just change that to be X or something else. But same thing here, but whatever, I'm going to uh, go ahead and plug a T in, plug a T in, and remember, I got to take the derivative of the t, which is one, and then I ignore the zero. And then here, when I take the derivative of that, again, the derivative and the integral cancel, and I plug a, a t in there, but there's nothing to plug in, so I just get five. Are you with me? And I drop the negative down, and then I set it equal to zero. So you know what? I actually realized, um, I actually did want you to find those times. Um, I engineered this so it would work out. So you can actually find the times. Look, if you multiply through by a negative, you get this and you get t minus five and t minus one when you factor. So at t equal five and at t equal one, those are some of the possible times uh, that I would use to determine this max. So all I would have to do now, which I'm not going to make you, it didn't ask for it in this, but, uh, but technically you didn't have to do this. You could have given me this equation right here, which is what you get when you integrate that, or you could have given me the original one I had here. So the original one I had, uh, if you go back and look at it, ah, man, um, the original one I had was uh, the 20 plus the integral from zero to t of negative x squared plus six x dx, and then minus, and you never go outside the boundaries here, from zero to t of five dx. So that right there, all of this set equal to zero, that would be okay. Or when you take the derivative of it, that would be okay. Okay? And remember, never go outside the box if they happen to give you a box, but I don't think that's gonna happen this year because you're probably gonna be working on your own paper unless you have time to print out what they've done. Okay, so there's your expression and those are other times because they're endpoints. And, um, and for this particular one, you've got two points for this expression. Um, we're just gonna say uh, one point for the initial condition. Um, now how about, we'll say this, one for setting it equal to zero. So one right there for setting it equal to zero. And then um, either one for this equation um, or one for all of this part right here. And then for the endpoints, we're gonna give you one as well. All right. And um, so, so far we've had what, one, two, three, four, five. That's uh, six, I'm gonna say, or six, seven, eight, one or the other right there. Again, I know I've got a little bit of a mess going on and that mess is largely due to the fact that I made these problems up um, to, to fit the narrative there. And then over here, um, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're just gonna say uh, one point for having 11 uh, and one fifth minutes up there on part D. All right, okay, so this, I'll say this is three points. This is one point. And then if you look back at number one, um, number one, that first part was two points, and this was one point. Um, so two points for that, one point for that, and two points for this. Okay? All right, so that's number one. Um, it's kind of, It was kind of a mess. Hopefully number two will be a little bit better. Um, so let's take a look. All right, so number two. Um, yeah, I had to do some modification of this, but I think this one will work out pretty well. Okay, so number two, it says uh, you got this first particle moving along with this velocity over this time interval. You've got, uh, and it also gave you a position and a time. And then you got particle B moving along with that velocity, evidently for every time interval, and it gave you its position. And then right here it says, find the acceleration of particle A. Well, how do I find an acceleration of particle A if they give me velocity? Well, you know, and remember how you gotta label this stuff, the acceleration of A, okay, acceleration of A is found by taking the derivative of the velocity. So I've gotta take the derivative of this 
And then when I'm done with that, I've got to plug in time three. So let's do that. How do I take a derivative of this fraction? Well, hopefully we know that that is a quotient rule. So low derivative of the high. So the derivative of the high would be, first of all, you just copy the two down. You take the derivative of sine of blah and you get cosine of blah. And then you take the derivative of the blah and you get a pi over four, which you're welcome to put up front, but I didn't leave room. All right, then you go minus high. So two sine of pi over four t d low, which is just 2t, all over the low squared, okay? All right, now you may have just noticed a small little miracle because I'm splicing these together, but um, actually, if you go back and look, yours is going to be fine. Yours said t equals 2 all the time, so if you're wondering why I was taking the acceleration at 3, uh, you're right. I had changed this problem, and 2 is the way I actually worked it. I forgot to change it. Anyway, bottom line, I want to take the acceleration of particle A at time 2, not at time three. So here I go at two now, all right? So obviously you don't have that freedom to change numbers like that, but again, I had to modify this a ton, um, so this is how it's working out. So now I know the acceleration at two, I'd have to plug a two in here. So I'm just gonna keep the fraction part and I'm just gonna plug a lot of that in since the way they give you points on a problem like this, um, the way they're gonna assign you points is uh, you're gonna give you a point for your actual uh, derivative so there is your uh, point for that. And then you're gonna give you a point for your simplified answer. So it's not a whole lot, it's not really important that you show all of your steps here. So plugging a two in there, I get four minus two is two. Plugging a two in there for t and I get two, a two in there. Two pi over four is pi over two. And cosine at pi over two, and pi over two in the unit circle straight up is zero. So all of that becomes a zero, which is great for me. All right, and then I plug a two there and two times pi over four gives me two pi over four, which is pi over two. Sine of pi over two is one straight up. So I have not only that negative two, but also a one. And then when I plug in two, a two in there, I also get a four. All right, so all of that left side's gone. And then when I plug a two in there, I get four minus two is two and two squared is four. So you could have done it with the three the way I had it originally. Although if but yours has said uh, two all along. So what that leaves me with is a negative eight over four. And we all know that a negative eight over four is a negative two. So evidently he was accelerating at a rate of negative two, but since they didn't give me any units here, I don't have to worry about right saying stuff like meters per second squared or units per time squared. I, I can just leave it as negative two. All right, part B says, find the position of particle B at time equal three. Well, I'm gonna go to the B uh, volume, I mean uh, velocity, but how do I find position from that? Okay, so for position for that, I'm gonna have to, to find the position function, which is x of t, and you don't have, you could call it anything you want, but um, I'm just gonna say, let this be position. In fact, they don't really even care that you give it a name. I'm gonna have to integrate this. Now, think about it for a second. I'm gonna come over here, all right? When I integrate a velocity function, right? So say I integrate the velocity of b of t, and I do that from a to b, I end up getting a position function of b, my, I'm gonna just say a position function of b minus a position function of a, okay? So I've got these position functions right here. The question is, where do I begin and end? Now I know that I have to know the position at three. So one of these needs to be three, it really doesn't matter. You could put three, if you put a three there, you got to put a three there. But I got to have a starting place. Well, if you go back to the original problem, what did they say? They said at time zero, I was at seven. So what I can do is I definitely can use zero here and here. If you want to put it there and there, you can. And then you have to use three as well. So three there and three there. And since I know that my position at zero is seven, I can go ahead and plug a seven in. All right, but the only way I'm going to actually evaluate this thing, right, is to actually integrate it. Now, I know that function, so I can integrate it. So what I'm going to do here is say, for my position function, my position at three, okay, is just going to be my integral from zero to three of the b function, the velocity of b, the b particle. So I'm going to 
put that function right here, right? And I'm gonna do that, and then I'm going to, um, to get this, I'm gonna do this, but I'm gonna add that seven to the other side. So this is me saying, all right, this is my change in my position added to my initial position, and that will be my position at time three. So this is the fundamental theorem. You can set it up thinking like this, and then just solve for x of three if you want. So you can set it up the whole way, or if you are getting to the point now where you're able to just say, hey, the final position is the change in position plus the initial position, that's fine too. But AP doesn't even need to see that right there because they didn't name it position. They don't need you to name it. All they need is that, okay? So for this particular one, you're gonna get credit one point for just saying that, okay? One point for using that initial condition, and then one point for your final answer that hopefully will be, will be able to get in a couple of seconds. So how do I integrate that expression? Well, and again, I've given you, um, I've modified this problem so we can actually do it. Before it was just a calculator. All right, so I'm having to insert a little adjustment there because I made a little careless error in my integration here. But at this point, I've got the fundamental theorem set up. All I gotta do is evaluate this. So t to the fourth over four, uh, when I integrate this, uh, minus uh, 2t cubed over 3, so minus 2t cubed over 3, minus 3t squared over 2, so minus 3t squared over 2, and I'm going to evaluate all of that from 0 to 3. Don't forget your plus 7. When I plug a 3 in there, um, I get basically 81, and you could do that in your calculator, over 4. My guess is, since they said... You don't need a calculator. It probably will make the math a little easier, but I don't know. It's not that bad. 3 to the 4th, 81 over 4. If I plug a 3 in there, I get 27 times 2, which is 54 over 3. And then when I plug a 3 in there, I get 27, 9 times 3 is 27 halves. So this would be kind of a mess, and that's the plugging the 3 in. When I plug a 0 in, I get 0 minus 0 minus 0, and then don't, again, don't forget the plus 7. So my guess is they would have probably engineered this problem so it would not have been as nasty. Um, but we can come in here and go 81 divided by 4 minus 54 divided by 3 minus 27 divided by 2. And then we're going to add 7 to the end and I get negative 4.25. All right, so our value was negative 4.25. And my guess is you would have gotten one point for the setup, one point for not forgetting the seven, and then one point for the answer to show that you can actually integrate. All right? All right, guys, so number C says, or letter C says, uh, write the expression um, you would use to evaluate this integral. Now, normally we would just take that velocity function, we would put it in there with the absolute value and let our calculator do the work. But it says, what would you do if you were not able to use a calculator? Well, if you remember about these velocities, absolute value of a function takes every part that's below an x-axis and flips it up. So what that does is when you start adding, when you start calculating the area below the curve, it's all positive area from zero to five. Well, the problem is our velocity function um, is, a, is a cubic function that does kind of a up, down, up, and it probably, more than likely, does that and it crosses the x-axis between zero and five. So the bottom line is there are probably some places, if, if, if this problem is being asked to you, there are some places where this graph has a negative area. And I don't wanna calculate it as negative area. I wanna calculate velocity uh, as positive area. So really, what am I doing here when I integrate velocity with absolute value? When I normally, when I integrate velocity, I get a change in position. And that's what would be happening here. Right? I might go to the right, some to the left, some to the right, some to the left, some, but it really just cares how much I've moved, where my position is in reference to where I was originally. That's what that represents, and I'm going to have to interpret that in a second. But this means the total distance traveled. Because this is going to take positive movement to the right and count it as positive, but because of the absolute value, any negative movement to the left, it's going to count that also as positive. Okay, so this is going to be the total distance that I traveled uh, or the particle total distance the particle moved. This is going to be the total uh, the change in position of the particle uh, on, on the axis. So right here, first, let's do this. So first to do this, I need to figure out if velocity crosses the x axis between zero and five. 
and I can do that. So I'm gonna take this velocity function, which is uh, the velocity function here is uh, of B, make sure you're labeling this well, is T cubed minus two T squared minus three T. And I wanna know where is it zero? Because if I know where it's zero, then I'll know, I can check and see where it's positive and negative and I can bring those negative parts up. So when I look at this, I factor a T out, that makes it significantly easier to solve. And then this part factors pretty easily. Uh, if you stink at factoring, I guess you could pull out your quadratic formula, but three and one, and this will foil all nicely if that's a negative three and a positive one, and you can check the foil, T squared, a positive T and a negative three to give a negative two T and then a negative three. So that tells me at T equals zero, at T equal three, and at T equal negative one. Now, I really don't care about negative one because it's not in the interval from zero to five. So this basically tells me this. This cubic function, if I thought about the graph of it, it's gonna cross here at negative one, it's gonna cross here at zero, and it crosses here at three. And what do you know about cubic graphs? You know, it kind of looks something like this. All right, now if you don't know that it looks like that, just pick a number in between zero and three, like the number one. If I plug one in this function, I get one minus two minus three, which that ends up giving me negative four. So at one, I'm down there at negative four. I can't have that. I've gotta make that part go higher, okay? So here's what I'm gonna do. But remember, I'm finding the area under the curve from zero to five. So I'm looking all the way out here to five. So I'm gonna keep the area from three to five like it is, but the area from zero to three, I'm gonna make this part make uh, it positive, all right? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna to integrate um, zero to five of the velocity function, okay, dt. I'm gonna integrate the zero to three part of the velocity. Okay, I'm gonna integrate that but I know it was negative, so I'm gonna change the sign of it. And then I'm gonna integrate the three to five part. It already was positive, so I'm going to leave it alone. And I think you probably remember doing that. And that will give me the absolute value. Now listen, if I had a calculator in a perfect world, I would just type this in my calculator. I would take that V function, put it in there, put an absolute value around it, boom, it spit out my answer. And it does it for me. But if I don't put absolute value around that, if I don't do it, or I don't consider the part that was negative and make it negate the negative part to make it positive, then I don't get this question. So to do this, um, um, my guess is, let me see if I have a uh, scoring guideline for this. Um, no, that scoring, because remember I've changed all this stuff up. So you're gonna get um, one point for finding that value of three where it's split and then one point for negating this part. So you got two points right there. And uh, then we're also going to look at saying, interpret the meaning of that in the context of this problem. So in the context of this problem, interpret the meaning So um, of each of these. So this from zero to five of VB TDT, uh, that means the what? The change in position, or for those physics people, the displacement, change in position of object B. And make sure you say object B here. And if it gave you units, use units, but it doesn't. All right, and then the part zero to five would be the distance. You gotta remember that, absolute value velocity, is distance. So that would be the distance that particle B traveled. All right? So the distance that it traveled and the change in position. You got to make those two uh, distinctions there. All right? And then these are going to be a half a point each. So um, that would be a total of three points for this part right here. And um, I'll go back and talk about the other points because I didn't do a fantastic job of that um, as well. All right, in part D, finally.
it says a third particle is moving uh, along the x-axis with a position given by this function from zero to five. It says at what time are particles B and C moving with the same velocity? Okay, well, let's think about it. What do I know about particle B? Well, particle B has a velocity given to me. Particle C does not, all right? But if I wanna know when the velocities are the same, seems like I could just set the velocities equal to each other. So velocity B, I wanna know basically when, it, at what time is velocity B equal to velocity C? That's what I'm looking for. Well, I know velocity B. It is T cubed minus two T squared minus three T. And velocity C, I can find by taking the derivative of this. So the, the velocity C, since uh, uh, velocity C is equal to the derivative of the position of C, I'm just gonna take the derivative of that, set these equal and solve. So what's the derivative of that? Well, four times a fourth is one T cubed two times negative nine halves would be 18 halves, which would be negative nine T. The derivative of three is zero, and all I have to do is solve this. And you'll see that this ends up being pretty nice, that those cancel, and I get negative T cubed. I can add nine T there to give me positive six T. And then to solve, all I have to do is to factor I could factor out a T or a negative T or, or negative two T, whatever. I'm just gonna do this. And that leaves me with a T minus a three. So you can see at T equals zero and at T equal three, I'm moving with the same velocity. But the question was at what time greater than zero do they have the same velocity? So that would be at time three. And if I was doing this, I would probably say you get one point for this expression. Um, uh, we're going to go back through all these points in a second. Let's just see how many actual points we had here. One, two, three, four, five. Um, this is probably going to be more than more than nine, but we're just going to say uh, one point for that expression and one point for the answer. So this ends up being a two-point section. Uh, the other part was three points. If you come back here to the original page two, um, that was a point, and that was a point for plus two points. And, um, and this also ended up being uh, a point for the, for the integral. Uh, we're just gonna go a half a point there for the seven, and then a half a point for getting the negative, I believe it was negative 4.25 that we got right there. So the negative 4.25, we're also gonna go to half a point. So that will give us a two points there, two points there, three and two points for a total of nine points. All right, so hopefully that helped and we'll see you guys later on three and four where we don't have to make modifications and lose our minds temporarily. Thanks.